Welcome back to the deep dive. So if you've been working with large language models, you know they kind of live a double life. They really do. On one hand, you have the friendly, often you know brilliant conversational agents we all talk to, the chatbots. Right. But then they're being drafted into this really serious work as embedded components. Think classifiers, routers, mm -hmm. things inside a production pipeline. And that second life creates a massive uh, architectural tension. When you hire an LLM for a really deterministic job like just output a zero or a one, you need it to turn off that chatty friend mode. You have to force it to be purely symbolic. Exactly. And the question is, can you really take a model that's been trained to be so conversational and prompt it into just total functional silence? That is the core conflict we're diving into today. Our sources analyze this uh, really rigorous empirical study that tested the absolute limits of output control. We're looking for that hard wall. The exact point where all your brilliant prompt engineering just stops working and the fundamental architecture takes over. Right. So the researchers, they tried to coerce a high performance chat trained a llama family model, specifically a llama vs 3.1 instruct variant. And this was running in a local environment, right? Using a llama. Yes. And that's a key detail. It means they weren't just typing into a web interface. OK, so let's define that for a second. When we say a llama, what level of control are we talking about? We're talking about total control. A llama lets you run these models locally, and crucially, it lets you use what's called a model file. Which is like the ultimate system prompt. It is. It lets you hard code constraints and behaviors before your user prompt even hits the model. So they used every tool they had, the model file, the system prompt, the user prompt, everything to try and achieve perfect control. And the task they gave it wasn't simple. Mm -hmm. It was ternary logic evaluation. No, not at all. It's a big step up from just binary true-false. So the logic values aren't just one for true or zero for false. Exactly. There's a third value in determinacy. A, we don't know, which they represented as a half. And that choice was deliberate, I'm guessing? Oh, absolutely. It forces the model to handle conceptual complexity. It has to resist its uh, natural tendency to just collapse uncertainty into a simple yes or no. So the goal, the target state, wasn't just get the answer right. It was an output mandate. A very strict one. The model had to emit exactly one symbol from the set 0, half 1, or its token equivalent, and absolutely nothing else. No explanatory text, no formatting, no conversational residue. Zero. And here's the crucial construct, the thing that makes this a real deep dive into the limits. They only use the model file and the prompt design. So no cheating with post-processing. No runtime stop conditions, no code to extract the answer. The goal was to see if the model could be convinced internally, just through language, to shut up and classify. OK, let's unpack this strategy. It really reads like a five-phase war against the model's desire to be helpful, the battle against bloat. That's a great way to put it. They started by focusing on the model's mind first, on the logical problem. Right, phase one and two. In those early phases, the model was just a typical chatbot. It was sloppy with the logic, it defaulted to binary answers, and it gave these, you know, long, verbose explanations. So the first step was what they called semantic enforcement. Yes. They had to introduce formal definitions for everything. All the ternary operators, not your euros, all of it, and explain exactly how that half value, that indeterminacy, propagates through a logic chain. And this is where prompt engineering really should work, right? And it did. They separated propositions from evidence, evidence from refutations. They just hammered the model with detailed rules. And it's successful. Highly successful. Yeah. The logical inconsistencies, the model mixing up evidence with actual truth, that all disappeared. Like the internal ternary evaluation became stable and correct. They had fixed its reasoning engine. But I'm guessing the output problem didn't go away. It just right. changed. You fix the brain, but the mouse still runs. That's exactly what happened. It became the world's most precise, yet still incredibly shatty logic professor. So even with perfect logic, it was still explaining things. Constantly. It would use probabilistic language like, based on the evidence, the answer is likely one, or it probably evaluates to half. And it would still try to teach you the concepts. Yes. Oh. It would give these lengthy examples of ternary logic, even though all it was asked for was the final answer. That has to be so frustrating when you just need a clean input for another machine, which I imagine leads directly to phase three, role restriction. Exactly right. They had to eliminate that instructional reflex. The constraint was a clear, absolute mandate. You are an evaluator, not an instructor. So they banned explanations, examples, derivations. They even banned code generation and latex formatting. That's like taking away all its favorite toys. 
Mm -hmm. Did it work? Did it stop teaching? For the most part, yes. The teaching behavior and the complex formatting were largely suppressed. If it started to write out a latex equation, it would just cut itself off. But the failure mode mutated again. It did. It shrank down to this tiny, persistent, conversational germ. What was the leftover residue? Just minimal conversational framing. Instead of a whole paragraph, you'd get one sentence. But it was still a sentence. Things like, the final answer is, or... Here is the result. A polite little robot that just won't turn off its sign-off phrase. Pretty much. Okay, this is where it gets really fascinating. Yeah. Because the researchers realized language itself might be the problem. Phases 4 and V were about extreme output hardening. They moved to non-linguistic sentinel tokens. So they took this, like, ultimate desperate step. They did. They stripped the entire output alphabet down to these non-linguistic markers. Out to OE, out half, and out T1. These aren't words. They're just unique symbols. And then in the final phase, they went after the prompt itself. Every last shred of politeness, no more questions, no please, just cold, imperative, classifier-style commands. You're demanding a deterministic output. And then they pulled the ultimate lever. They set the temperature to absolute zero. Which should eliminate all randomness. It forces the model to pick the single most probable next token every single time. It should. So after all of that, what did they observe about the model's internal process? Its internal classification became fully deterministic. The model was absolutely stable in its reasoning. It completely respected the sentinel tokens. It knew with 100% certainty that the logical result was, say, both half. The model's mind was perfect. Flawless. So, after this incredible effort, five phases, stripping away logic errors, teaching, politeness, even common words, what was the one irreducible failure? What was that final hard wall? The model consistently, and I mean across every single test case and every prompt iteration, it continued to wrap the correct central token in that minimal conversational framing. So it would still say something like, The final answer is oath half. That wrapper text survived every constraint, every model file setting, every rewrite, and even zero temperature. Wow. That's the central paradox of the study, isn't it? It really is. They successfully got rid of every reasoning error. All the probabilistic language, the code, the verbose instructions. The internal classification was perfect. The failure was purely one of output termination and framing. It's profound because it shows the model knew the right answer, and it knew the required token but it was architecturally incapable of emitting only that token. It's like a brilliant scientist who insists on signing every single equation with best regards, your faithful LLM. Exactly. So we have to ask the critical question, why? If the prompt says output only the token and the temperature is zero, why does the model insist on that little introductory sentence? Why is it so compelled to converse? This is the core mechanical insight from the study. The behavior isn't a prompt ambiguity error. It stems from... Uh, decoder-level conversational priors that are introduced after pre-training. Jury instruction tuning in RLHF. Yes. Reinforcement learning from human feedback. Wait, hold on. So you're saying the very thing that makes these models helpful and safe, the RLHF process, is also the fatal flaw when we try to use them as silent machines? Hmm. That is the fundamental trade-off. Wow. RLHF trains the model by rewarding token sequences that align with what a human thinks is a good, helpful answer. And those reward models encode a really powerful policy. That a good answer has to be a complete human readable utterance. Exactly. It must be framed like a sentence. It should start with a phrase and then present the answer. So the model isn't just rewarded for the right content. It's rewarded for following a certain sentence structure. Precisely. The system prompts and the model files can successfully bias the content. They can tell it to use ternary logic or to classify instead of explain, but they can't fully override that learned response framing policy that insists on a sentence structure. Because that policy is deeper. It's rooted in the decoding mechanics from the reward function. It is. It's about what was prioritized during that alignment tuning. Conversational completeness was prioritized. This really highlights a crucial division of labor that you, know, you need to understand. The system prompt controls what the model says, but the RLHF controls the fundamental way the model is structurally permitted to say it. And the researchers established a clear boundary. They emphasize that this is a negative result, but that's incredibly valuable because it shows what can't be done. It defines a hard, reproducible limit for this whole class of chat-trained models. Right. So this means you can stop wasting hours trying to find that one perfect magic prompt that finally silences the model mm -hmm. because it doesn't exist. 
not within the architectural constraints of an RL HF aligned system. That constraint is baked in. The failure is a property of the chat trained model class itself, not a failure of your prompt engineering technique. They proved that prompt ingenuity has a heart ceiling for this kind of output control. Okay, let's talk implications. What does this all mean for you, the listener, who might be trying to deploy one of these models? Takeaway one seems clear. Adding more constraints past a certain point gives you absolutely nothing. Diminishing returns, that's the crucial point. Once you've logically constrained the model, trying to micromanage the output format with more prompt tweaks is a pointless exercise. So any claim that these chat models can be made fully deterministic or perfectly obedient just through clever prompting. It's empirically false, at least when you're talking about controlling the output format down to a single bare token. Which has huge consequences for production systems. If you're building a router that needs a single one or one to trigger the next step, you cannot rely on the LLM's prompt adherence alone. Absolutely not. The study confirms that if you're using a chat-trained LLM as a classifier in production, you must rely on external infrastructure to manage the output. These systems aren't optional then. There are structural requirements. They are. So what are the specific tools you need based on the source material? Well, the researchers conclude you have to use one of three methods to get around that conversational wrapper. Mm -hmm. First is runtime stop tokens. Tell the system to stop generation the moment it sees your target token. Okay. Second is output truncation, which is simpler. You just cut the text after the first meaningful token. Or third, post-processing extraction, where your code just pulls the token it needs out of the sentence. So you basically need a janitor service to clean up the polite mess the model insists on making. That's a good way to think about it. You delegate the reasoning to the model, and you delegate the compliance enforcement to your code base. You stop fighting the model's architecture, and you start working around it. The study also offers an alternative, though, for people who need that absolute precision without the cleanup crew. It does. If your goal is strictly symbolic output, a pure classifier, the source material suggests that base models are probably a better fit. And those are models that haven't had the instruction tuning or RLHF. Exactly. They haven't had that powerful conversational framing prior install to the same degree. The limitation is introduced during the chat fine tuning, not the foundational pre-training. That makes perfect sense. The very process that makes it a helpful general intelligence hobbles its ability to be a silent, obedient classification machine. It's the inherent trade-off. We can use prompts to shape the model's internal logic, even make it deterministic. But the output framing and termination, that remains a fundamental concern of the deployment infrastructure and the model architecture. Prompt ingenuity just can't get you all the way there. It can only take you so far. So we've reached the hard ceiling. Here's a final provocative thought for you to chew on. If the model's fundamental training requires it to communicate in human readable utterances, if it must wrap its answer in a sentence, even for a non-linguistic token like youth half, what does that imply about the nature of intelligence versus behavioral alignment in these systems? I mean, if the model gets penalized in its reward structure for simply outputting a number because that scene is unhelpful or abrupt, is that compulsion to converse something we can ever truly train out? Or is that structural politeness just inextricably linked to their utility as the general reasoning engines we rely on to be cooperative? Is the refusal to be silent simply the price we pay for helpfulness? That is a boundary worth exploring further. Thank you for joining us for the deep dive.